Um, so yeah, so basically we, we've we've shared a similar vision. Uh, the the six five five one vision before it really had a name, I guess, or was becoming a standard. And that vision is that NFTs more than wallets are going to be our identities or already are our identities in web3 so what we're doing at nifter is you can name your nft with a unique name so now you have a quick way to refer to the nft by name and kind of navigate towards it uh in its uh, uh in its profile page and then our plan is to be able to deploy tbas on the nft profile pages um similar to what what token bound has done um but also be able to name the token bound accounts so if an nft uh, has multiple token bound accounts which is kind of what we're expecting is going to happen you can name um your those token bound accounts individually with subdomain names so for example if my nft is named digital oil and our domain name is nifter so digitaloil.nifter then uh its banking account would be banking.digitaloil.nifter um so and and maybe it's airdrop account would be airdrops that digital oil that nifter for example so that's uh that's what we're doing with 6551 for now basically providing people with a an, a nice way to interact to deploy and interact with these accounts and also kind of um push a naming standard for these accounts through our nft uh naming service thanks guys for listening Awesome, welcome, welcome. Okay, uh, Richard and anyone else who wanna raise their hands, that would be great, but Richard, go ahead. Hey guys, um, I'm uh, Richard, uh, been in crypto since uh, 2017, uh, launched a crypto fund called um, GBIC. Um, and in um, 2019, uh, launched a uh, token project called um, STP, uh, and it's mostly focused around uh, around DAOs, um, mostly on the um, and ecosystem side. Um, and then recently came across um, ERC six five five one, and then saw that um, Benny and a couple others uh, were involved and have been really uh, kind of diving like deep uh, into this uh, new concept um, and am pretty uh, intrigued about the potential. So still kind of exploring ways um, on how to uh, interact um, and make it uh, more of a product. Awesome. Good to see you again, Richard. Glad you're here. Uh, Steve, uh, welcome. Do you want to do a quick intro? Yeah, thanks so much, Benny. Uh, hey guys, my name's Steve. I'm the uh, head of community for Pinata. Um, and as probably a lot of you know, Pinata is all about NFTs, IPFS. And so uh, myself and our CEO, Kyle, have really seen how 6551 is looking like, uh, has some real potential for NFTs and expanding them beyond what they're you know, currently doing. And so we're really excited to see what it's doing. So uh, we're in the process of uh, just exploring it, writing a lot of blog post contents. Uh, I think we're going to do our own page for deploying token bound accounts as well, just helping people, uh, you know, engage with it, uh, you know, experience it and see, you know, how cool it is. I think we're going to probably look into building a game as well, just to display, uh, you know, what's possible with 6551. So uh, just really excited to be here just to you know learn from everybody and see what everybody's working on awesome welcome welcome uh ruslan do you want to do a quick intro yeah hey everybody um excited to be here and to be in this group um my name is ruslan i have a startup called groove setter i'm working on the nft uh, project right now and i got really excited about uh, uh, this new standard that you guys have created, NFTs as wallets. So I discovered it about a month ago. So I've, I've been visiting some of the working groups here in the last couple of meetings. But I'm also involved in the Metaverse Standard Forum, which is a, uh, a nonprofit organization 
where the leading standards development organizations and companies cooperate to foster uh, interoperability standards for the open metaverse. Uh, so there's, a, I believe, over 2,000 companies that joined since it was launched last year. And I'm involved in the digital asset management working group. I'm one of the chairs there and also uh, the standards register group. So right now there's an event happening um, starting Monday called SIGGRAPH, uh, which is big for the 3D industry. And we will be announcing the, the standards register, uh, which is essentially a, a, a list of all the standard development organizations working on standards in, um, uh, in the metaverse. Um, OMA3, if you guys have heard of OMA3, is, is a member of the standards, Metaverse Standards Forum. And just recently, there was a liaison agreement between the MSF and, and OMA3. And I encourage any company here that's on this call, and including Future Primitive, to, to join the Metaverse Standard Forum. It's free. And then uh, join the discussions in the working groups. Uh, a big topic of discussion that we're pushing forward at the Digital Asset Management is is you know the use of wallets and in and, and blockchain and of course nfts as wallets is, is super amazing so would love to see you guys there and i've already mentioned the standard in the group and and we're publishing a report where it will be included so yeah that's a brief introduction i'm, I'm really digging what you guys are doing and, and i'm looking forward to to using the tech awesome welcome welcome thanks for joining us um, anyone else? Last call on introductions. If you, you know, you could be a new member. Hopefully, you're a new member. Or if you wanted to, just kind of give like a thirty second. No. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna pass the mic to Jaden, and um, he's gonna provide a few updates on the EIP and a few things that the team has been working on. Um, so yeah, Jaden. Sounds good. Hey, folks. Sorry, just uh, navigating some audio things. But yeah, um, yeah. So we've been working on a bunch of stuff behind the scenes on the EIP side. Uh, the biggest of which shipped last week. So uh, if you haven't had a chance, if you've read the spec already, uh, but haven't read it recently, we just shipped an update to it. Uh, I can drop a link here. Um, but basically, we've been we've spent the last couple of months since the standard originally launched, going through and uh, gathering as much feedback from everyone on the ETH Magicians Forum, everybody in the working group, all of you all here, as well as just folks in the ecosystem, about some of the uh, you know the potential issues with the way 6551 was set up, but any ways to, to mitigate those. So we've received a ton of really, really valuable feedback. Uh, based on that, we have um, made some changes to the EIP spec. Uh, for most of the projects that you're probably building, like if you're working on NFT projects, uh, and using an existing uh, account implementation, uh, these changes won't really affect you. These only really affect you if you are working with, uh, if you're building a custom implementation. Um, they, if you're just using kind of the off-the-shelf implementations, there'll be a migration path for you there. But um, we went over a little bit of the details last week about what's changing um, in kind of the, the pre-release draft. Uh, but since last week, we've shipped that draft to review. So it's now live, it's up there on the, uh, the ETH Magicians website. And uh, because we're going from a draft form of the EIP to review, uh, it'll be a little bit before it gets reviewed by the EIP editors. Basically, this is kind of going from a uh, like a pre-release to like a beta, where we expect once it goes to review, it'll be quite a bit more stable. There'll be less changes to the spec, um, and you know, as we get closer to finalization, uh, it'll be a little bit more stable to build on. So this has been a, a milestone that we've been working to, working towards for quite a while. Uh, and exciting to see it it getting there. So if you want to take a look at the new EIP coming down the pipe, um, it's in the ETH Magicians uh, forum thread. I will link to the post here uh, in the chat. And so y'all can go here and read it. And there's a summary of all the changes in this particular uh, update to the EIP in this post in the ETH Magicians thread. And then there's a link to the PR for it. And so all the details you need to know to kind of familiarize yourself with what's happening with the EIP change will be there. Uh, the goal is that, you know, if you're building on top of the token bound implementation or if you're just a user of, to of token bound accounts and you're playing with things and throwing things in your NFT, this won't affect you very much. This will mostly affect projects that are working with custom implementations um, because the implementation that we built will have uh, some upgrades for it and there'll be a migration path there. Um, 
So yeah, I, I would love any and all feedback on this. This uh, update to the spec is based on uh, the last couple of months of feedback that we've been gathering. Um, but it, we, you know, as a part of this process, we want to get as as much feedback as possible. Make sure that all of the opinions are heard, all of the voices are heard, and all of the trade offs are considered before this gets finalized. Um, so yeah, we'd love all of you all to take a read to the spec and give us some feedback. Um, if there's anybody who has thoughts on this, I know it's been out for a few days now. If anybody has thoughts on this or wanted to start a discussion around it, I uh, would love to hear those and would love to give some room for discussion here. So, Jaden, uh, I, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of field the questions. Um, now that it's in review, of course, you, you, we don't know how long it's going to take for it to be finalized. But, like, what does it usually look like? Could it be, you know, one week, one month, six months, one year, five years? You know, like, just like, what has it looked like for other EIPs that have um, become finalized? Yeah, it really depends on the EIP, um, and it's a little bit of a black box. There's no timeline guarantees. In terms of what we'd love, like we're working to try and get this finalized before the end of the year. That's our goal. Um, but you know, it, it is a little bit out of our hands and just part of the EIP process. The biggest thing that if you if this is something you want to use, if this is something you want to have finalized, the single biggest thing that you can do to help achieve that goal is a, you know, what you're already doing, which is building on top of the standard. B talking about the standard and how it solves issues you have. One of the things that um, you know, when we look at finalization of this, that will be looked for is, uh, is this actually a useful pattern for people? Are people building on top of this? Is this solving real problems? Um, is this actually something that people want to use? Um, and then third would be providing any, any feedback. So um, having lots of comments, lots of discussion in the magician thread is super, super valuable uh, and lets us, you know, kind of prove that there are people who are interested in uh, in this and it's not just a, a random spec that got written up. So um, yeah, no particular timelines on it. We, we we're, Our goal is to have it finalized by the end of the year, um, but we want to make sure, like, like we're saying, that all the voices are heard and all the feedback is there um, before we get there. So this, this move from draft to review is actually a pretty big step in that direction. Um, some other pretty popular EIPs, you know, for example, ERC 4337, which is getting a lot of usage, is still in draft stage uh, because they're still making pretty active changes to the spec and things might very well change at, at any time. Um, moving to review is our is kind of uh, making things a little bit more stable. So in our case, like we want to minimize breaking changes to the spec from here on out. So our goal is that this is the this is one the one big change that will be made to the EIP before it gets finalized. And anything after here will be small non-breaking changes. That's the goal that we're pursuing here. Uh, so this is a pretty big step towards finalization. Uh, it is a um, it is something we've been working on for a little while, and uh, yeah, hopefully uh, for folks building on it, this is a little bit easier to build on, and uh, you know, the, uh, the, a little bit more stable of a foundation to build on. And one thing that I found super—I I know this is more less uh, important, but if you look at the ETH magicians form for six five five one, the activity there's one hundred eighty-eight. Um, I guess comments and feedback from the community from you guys, and something like ERC four two three seven only you know which started by Vitalik in September twenty twenty one has about eleven one hundred and twelve. I mean, of course, comments don't really matter, but like in terms of like the fact that we've launched as a community this standard, um, and within the last four months it, it has grown so much, and people are already building, and there's a lot of talk about it because of everybody here in this community. Um, I, I think the momentum is like picking up and, and still is, you know, so um, props to everybody. And, you know, we encourage continuous feedback on that front. Um, so we're really excited. And to be clear, this is not a competition or anything, right? Like every EIP is its own journey. This is just a good benchmark, right? If you're considering building on ERC 6551, benchmarking it against something like ERC 4337, which uh, you know, a lot of folks are pretty comfortable building on top of. Um, we'll give kind of a sense of like, hopefully, like feeling confident in, in building on top of. But it's by no means a comparison or or a better or worse thing. Hundred um, percent. 
I guess one question for you, uh, Jaden, is because this, I, mean, I know there's a lot of people who already understand the, the differences, but what's the difference between 4227 and 6551? It's like a common question. Um, uh, like you have companies like Pimlico and um, what well, I don't know, the, the um, by economy and stuff. So like, is 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 six five f one the accounts extraction for NFTs? And if so, do, can it use all the infrastructure that's available? I think this is a common question that a lot of people ask. Yeah, it's a good question. So in a nutshell, four three three seven provides the infrastructure and like a a standard for allowing smart contract accounts to kind of act like uh, EOAs, like you know normal wallets that we're used to. It's me. It lets them uh, have their gas paid for through paymasters. It lets them be automatically deployed. Um, it handles the uh, like the the life cycle of it, so that all you have to do is sign a message, and the transaction gets executed, rather than having to always pay the gas to execute that transaction. The gas is handled by bundler. So it's a whole system that allows smart contract accounts to have some similar features to EOA accounts, uh, and make ideally make smart contract accounts more usable. So that's kind of 4337's domain. They're doing a whole bunch of stuff around, you know, like a censorship resistant mempool and and uh, and things like that. Kind of building a decentralized system for giving smart contract accounts the same abilities as an EOA. Um, 6551 is, is like kind of related in that we're both working on smart accounts, smart contract accounts. Um, but 6551 isn't really worried about the mechanics of how smart contract accounts work from a uh, like transaction execution standpoint. Uh, in fact, like we've done the best that we can in this new version of the IP to get away from prescribing anything to do with uh, uh, with execution. But all 6551 is doing is it's providing a way to tie smart contract accounts to NFTs. Uh, so it kind of defines what a token bound account is. It defines a way that every NFT can have accounts bound to it in a deterministic way. And then it defines some very light functionality that those accounts should implement. So the ways that a token bound account should work. So they're kind of similar in that they're both working on smart contract accounts, but 4337 is taking care of much more lower level problems around bringing features to all smart contract accounts. 6551 is focused specifically on smart contract accounts tied to NFTs. Um, and they do work pretty well together. So um, you, you can think about 6551 as like account abstraction for NFTs. Every NFT gets a uh, abstracted smart account. Um, and so right now there is, uh, you can use the 6551 contracts that we've developed the token bound implementation with the 4337 entry points on chain, right? That'll work. You can, you can uh, use it with the 4337 smart contracts. Um, the thing where 6551 is slightly non-standard when it comes to 4337 is in storage access. And so right now 6551 uh, is compatible with some 4337 tooling but not all of it because it is slightly non-standard. Um, and so like we've seen some folks who at hackathons have built like 437, 6551 integrations and it worked, it's worked really well for them. Um, but there are some, like if you are going down that path, there are some things that you might run into. Uh, we're focused right now, actually, one of the things that we wanna do in the next little while is make it much easier for developers to combine 4337 and 6551. Um, so we've got some, some tooling that we've been working on coming out there. Uh, but yeah, they can they can work really well together. Four three three seven is solving problems for all smart contract accounts. ERC six five five one is focused on NFT smart contract accounts. Awesome, uh, Jaden. Is there any other updates on the docs or SDK or anything that the folks? I think there was some mention of like um, an infrastructure company. Uh, I think it was maybe a question to Raymond, but. Um, and n.xyz APIs terminated. So there's some questions around the iframe. Yeah, for sure. So uh, there is some work being done in the iframe. There's a one of the input providers that we're using for uh, tracking approvals is going down. Um, so we're, we're going to switch that over to a new provider. If you're using the iframe uh, pointed at the token bound um, site, you should just get that update out of the box. If you are self hosting the iframe, uh, you might need to upgrade it to the next version that we release. Um, so we'll we'll be sure to message that out in the token bound chat when that happens. But yeah, so uh, XYZ is is uh, got acquired and is shutting down. So we'll be moving to another data source. Right now, the best uh, indexing uh, platform for six five five one accounts is Airstack, and so definitely recommend folks check that out if they're building 
um, indexing related features. But yeah, on, on the other side, we've been doing a lot of bug fixes, uh, small changes to the token bound site, uh, working on handling transfers and handling transactions and things like that. Um, the SDK, we're working on giving, making it easier to interact with the token bound accounts. So we, right now, the SDK exposes a very low level execute call function that still requires you to manually encode call data. Um, we've noticed that's been a bit finicky for folks, and so we're starting to provide uh, methods so you'll be able to have like a transfer ERC-20, transfer ERC-721, transfer ERC-1155 methods um, that you can just call and pass in the data, and it'll handle all of the details behind the scenes. So that way, you just don't have to be manually encoding call data all over your app, which is kind of a pain. Um, so that'll be among some of the changes that we're making in the next um, next SDK update. Um, again, we'll post in the token bound uh, working group chat when that's ready. Awesome. I think we could open up the floor to questions. So any questions, even if it's high level, all the way to like a, a super technical question. Any questions from the community here? Yeah, not exactly on topic, but but on 4337, a quick question for Jay. Um, you mentioned that 4337 is making uh, smart contract accounts more like EOAs. But, but on the flip side, isn't there also a, a uh, like on the flip side, don't EOAs also become or ha gain uh, smart contract account functionality as well? Uh, not with 437. There are a couple no. of other proposals. Um, so this whole concept of account abstraction is basically just um, getting rid of EOA accounts. So separating like the private key that you own from your address. So instead of one private key, one address, one private key can control many addresses. The address isn't necessarily corresponding to a private key. And so one way to do that is 437, which just does it through a, a structure of smart contracts. Um, but there are a couple of other account abstraction proposals that actually propose consensus changes, so changes to how Ethereum works. Um, there was one proposed just a, a week or two ago by one of the ETH core devs. Um, that's there's some good conversation on right now. So there are longer term plans for ah. EOAs to become like smart contracts. Like basically, you'll be able to deploy a smart contract to your EOA's address or delegate execution at your EOA's address for smart contract. But those are a ways away because the core dev community is still figuring out how that would work well. Got it, got it. So those, those are more like EIPs, whereas this one is an actual ERC. The one that yeah. Vitalik talks a lot about is mostly the long-term EIP type that you just referred to, I guess, that I was that I was referring to as well. Without yeah, knowing, right? yeah, exactly. So 4337 gotcha. solves this in like user land. So you can use 4337 today. Um, it's just a bunch of smart contracts, but the changes that will happen to the actual Ethereum protocol uh, are a little bit further down the line. Thanks. All right, any other questions from the community? Final call on that front. And as always, even if you, um, you know, maybe you're out on mobile and it's too loud. Okay, Vishwa, go ahead. Hey guys, how's it going? Um... Jaden, I'd sent you a DM uh, after last time's call. I think we all got pretty tied up. Uh, we didn't get a chance to address that conversation we were having about um, sub-states within uh, token-bound accounts, um, which we were having last time. Uh, so would you want to maybe talk about it in uh, in the DM, or maybe we can have that conversation right now? Yeah, we could totally have that now if you want. Sorry about that. My DMs are a little flooded these days. Uh, but yeah, if you're happy to happy to chat about it. Um, so I guess like the uh, just just trying to gather context. We've had a bit of a week <laughs> this this week with everything that happened with Curve and stuff. So I'm just trying to context switch. Um, but I think the last time we were talking about uh, flash loans specifically with uh, with NFTs, right? And how uh, there's no lock function that could exist on the token bound account if there's other fungible tokens inside the wallet and so if somebody have you know for the purposes of a flash loan uh borrows the token bound account they could return the token bound account and whilst the the loan itself the contract will say that that particular behavior is you know the the behavior that was supposed to exist has happened 
simultaneously there's also been a change of state of that token bond account with respect to the fungible token balance so is that some uh you know like how would we go to address that from an application level or from even a standard level uh, was kind of i think the conversation we were having last time yeah for sure so this actually ties in really well to some of the things we did in the ip so there's one change that's really small but will actually have a really big effect in addressing issues like this so previously we had this idea of a nonce uh, there's a nonce function on every token about account that you could call and the nonce worked like nonces work in any other case, right? It's an auto incrementing value that goes up every time um, you execute a transaction on the account. Um, the challenge with that is it doesn't give you a lot of insight into what's actually happening behind the scenes. You just know that something changed, but you don't know what changed or how it changed. Um, so we've replaced that nonce function with a function called state, which right now there's no definition on what that should return. It just is a value that should change every time something happens within the token about account. But the idea is that by removing this concept of a nonce, which has a very specific definition, and allowing accounts to externally expose a representation of their state, that'll allow for a lot more, um, a lot more flexibility when account implementations decide how to communicate their state to the outside world. So it gives you the ability to do things like uh, signal to the outside world that there are existing approvals on the account, or signal to the world that uh, you know something has changed. So one thing in this case of flash loan, I think supporting flash loans on token bad accounts is actually expected behavior. Like if you have your NFT in a lending pool and somebody flash loans the NFT out of the lending pool, they should have access to your token bad account um, because they own the NFT for the duration of that transaction. And the challenge becomes, should they be able to put that NFT back into the lending pool? And how should that affect the value of the NFT in the lending pool? So in that case, it would be up to the lending pool to determine how it wants to handle um, token bound account states upon entering the lending pool. Um, because if you flash loan the NFT out, remove something from the token bound account, that, um, that removal will cause the state value to change. Good. So when you go to put it back into the, to into the pool, if the pool is aware of token bound accounts, they can introspect the state of that account and say, hey, actually, you can't put it back in. Sorry, um, the state has changed, and just revert the transaction. Or, you know, if they wanted to be a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit more like specific about it, it could be like, all right, you can put it back into the pool, but at a lower valuation because you know we know you just took something out of it. Um, so hopefully, this is a even though it's a very small change, this will allow different pools and different like protocols to interact with the state of token about accounts in a way that allows you to do things that are expected, like doing flash loans, but also allows you to protect your protocol. That, that's, a, that's a great insight. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to incorporate some of these, uh, th this new insight into, into building out the prototype of what we're thinking of building. And I know I said we'll do a presentation this week, but I haven't had any time to get to it. So hopefully by next week, we'll have something ready to show you guys. Amazing. Yeah, we'd love to see it. And I will track down that DM and we can chat more about the specifics. There are some specific patterns we're thinking of on the state side that may get written, written into the EIP at some point, uh, but it's still pretty early in the research phase. I just pushed it to the top of your, well, to the top now, I guess it's going to, someone's going to add to it at some point, but I just, I just made it easier for you to access on TG. Perfect. Thank you. Jaden, do yeah, we want to go into demos? or? Yeah, go ahead, Digital Oil. I was just going to say that the uh, I was happy to see the change from nonce to state as it also not, not only solves a lending pool or, or aids in the solution of the lending pool problem that Jay described, but also uh, the marketplace problem where you could front run somebody who's, who's buying your NFT ripoff assets. Uh, with the nonce, you could do it uh, by having like a pre-approved a third party to move assets on your uh, of your token bond account and that wouldn't change the nonce because it's not happening you know it's not being triggered by the owner of the nft right so i think i think uh I, you know I, I welcome the 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 change to state um my question is do uh do you anticipate that state will be kind of just like a counter or will it be a rich like a more rich variable yeah so that's kind of an open question right now um i think at the moment the way that we're leaning is that implementations will define what state looks like to them 
And then there will be different standards for what that state should look like. So we're working with seaports on going through on building out a seaport improvement proposal for 6551 accounts. And so in there would be where we might define like, okay, if you want to have seaport support for your token bond account, here's what the state should look like. Um, so it's it's kind of an open question as to whether that definition of state will be part of the EIP or part of a, a separate standard. Um, because just because of like we want to give account implementations the max amount of flexibility and be pretty minimal with the things that we enforce. But there there are some like some common patterns that seem like they might be emerging around states. Um, one that we're considering right now, for example, is if if state is a hash of the call data that you send when you execute a transaction from the account, um, that would mean that you basically have a like a continuous history of all the transactions that have happened. And it also means that state is deterministic based on the transactions you execute. And so you could have a, a case where in order to do something in your protocol, you have to kind of use that state value to prove that there are no active approvals. Um, or you could have, you know, look at that state value. And if you know there are active approvals, you could say, okay, the only way that this token about account will be functional within our protocol, or, you know, in the case of OpenSea, you say the only way this order will be valid is if the state matches a future state where all the approvals have been revoked. Um, so that's one approach that's kind of interesting is using if, if state is like a hash of all of the transactions that have been executed against the account. Um, but there are other <laughs> other things that we're kind of researching right now in that regard. That, that actually gives me an idea. You could do like zero knowledge state transitions within the TBA using state as, you know, like a Merkle root or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, you could you could basically like if it's a hash of all the executed call data, you could do things like have like zero knowledge proofs about like you have a zero knowledge proof that proves that there are. Oh, it's not zero knowledge because you can like all the data is public. So you know what the transactions are. But you would be able to have like succinct proofs that there are no um, there are no approvals on an account or that an account has done a certain action X amount of times. Right. Um, the counterpoint to this is that it introduces another storage slot that has to be updated within every transaction. So it is a gas overhead hit for that all token bound accounts would have to incur. So we're kind of like exploring that trade off to see if it's worthwhile right now. But that's one of the ideas that we're researching on the, the state side as we look at how we can integrate this with marketplaces. Cool. Um, yeah, I think if we can open the floor for demos. If anyone's been working on cool stuff on 6551 projects, we'd love to give you the floor to share a little bit of it, uh, even if it's super work in progress or um, you know, super, uh, super, um, like just, uh, it could even just be stuff that you're exploring at the idea phase, but we'd love to give folks the ability to demo. Feel free to go for it there, Chase. Well, let me, uh, if I can get permission to share my screen, I can demo some stuff here for you guys. Yeah, give me a sec. Go for it. Awesome. Okay, so I need to do a little bit of background here. Uh, our, our project doesn't just use 6551, but it's a, it's a relatively important part. Um, so I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of a, a company called Vaporware. We're, we're building on top of the, the Urbit stack, uh, and we're using 6551 uh, to sort of monetize uh, software that's built on top of Urbit. Um, one, one way that we've started to talk about this is like basically turning it like NFTs into peer to peer software or turning NFTs into sort of like executable or, or programmable, um, applications. So, uh, Jaden, I, I think you had mentioned, uh, at one point that you were familiar with Urbit. Urbit's not that large of a project yet. So I'll, I'll do just a little bit of background, uh, to, to like level set here. Um, so Urbit, Urbit is basically the first attempt that I am aware of of creating a, a purely functional uh, virtual machine. And in particular, the VM's basically been constructed to, to run containers. Um, and it's been constructed to, to basically allow normal like end users to run 
to run the VM, but more importantly, to, to run and maintain the containers. Um, the fact that it's purely functional is important because that gives us a, a bunch of sort of like uh, nice properties around stability uh, and just like maintainability, which is needed if we're gonna ask, you know, instead of developers managing a VM and, and like using containers, uh, asking sort of end consumers to do it. Um, and so the the rough like mental model here for Urban is like, think about it basically as like a little mini blockchain uh, for, for each for each user. Messages come in and before any computation happens on the message, uh, the message is written to a write ahead log. So you've got this, this chain of events that's coming into your, your Urbit virtual machine, the messages, uh, the events are being logged, and then whatever computation occurs uh, only happens after that. So uh, it's immutable, uh, it's pure and refer referentially transparent. Um, and then you know, we get like nice uh, like ACID um, guarantees basically because, because the, the events are sequential and, and isolated. Um, and, and this is very important from sort of like the stability perspective, right? Like the, the pitch that sort of Urbit has is um, because the machine has been designed this way, uh, it's very easy to run. Uh, it's easier to maintain than your iPhone. It's not quite zero maintenance, but, you know, it's not like your computer is a rock, but maybe it's like a, a cactus or something uh, requires very little maintenance. Uh, and so because we're able to do this, this means that individual users can, can run complex software uh, and they can run that complex software without needing the system administrators or like learning how to do um, uh, sort of like operations within Linux. Um, the the actual virtual machine, right? Like the, it's kind of cool to have a new VM, but the, the point of the VM is to have these containers that can run applications. Um, so each of these, these boxes here is, uh, you know, a, a basically a namespace container within uh, an Urbit VM. The, each Urbit VM actually already has a fixed ID. Uh, so these are all networked together uh, and the IDs are represented as an NFT on Ethereum. Um, so when you're talking, like when your Urbit VM is communicating with another Urbit VM, it's, it's doing so by basically using uh, the set of NFTs as like a, a, a PKI. Uh, and so that's, how we sort of do routing between these these nodes uh, and deal with things like you know civil attacks uh, because each node has a has a fixed ID it, it becomes like pretty easy to deal with spam. Um, what's interesting here is that not only does the VM have a fixed ID represented by an NFT, but but each uh, container within the VM has uh, a unique uh, namespace within within that VM. Um, so the the like larger network has fixed ids and then within any given vm uh each container has a specific uh piece of the namespace and all these are networked together so my urbit if i if i know what your urbit id is and that you have a particular container uh, and i have the right permissions you've given me the right permissions one of my containers one of my applications can, can kind of like seamlessly communicate with yours as, as if it was on my my own computer as well um, so at this point in Urbit's development, like the the node to node communication is working really well, uh, and the containers are basically open to third parties, so you can develop third party applications on on top of the network. Um, Urbit gives you a whole bunch of tools as a developer out of the box, like uh, like the networking, the peer discovery. Um, there's like cryptography stuff built into it. Uh, you get sort of like automatic persistence. The, the issue is that there's no way to sort of like monetize these, these containers at this point. And the idea is that we want individual users uh, building on top of this stuff. Um, so what Vaporware is doing, what, what my company is doing, is we're basically taking the idea that Urbit pioneered, which is like, let's connect a concrete unit of compute, the VM, to a, an NFT. And we're extending that to the individual containers that are running on Urbit nodes now. So we've built a, a bridge between Urbit and Ethereum, uh, and our bridge uh, allows developers or, or projects uh, to associate the, the code that is stored in their container with an NFT. Uh, and when that NFT is minted or bought and sold on a secondary market, the, uh, the software that we've built basically 
pulls an RPC node, watches that, and does an automatic sort of like state replication across that node. So if I come and buy uh, one of these like container NFTs from Jaden, uh, when when that occurs, Jaden's uh, orbit would automatically transfer the the state and the code that's in that container over to me, and that that happens in a completely decentralized way. Um, so this is kind of like a, a very radical the thing to do with nfts like we're we're moving just from like jpegs basically or or like static files to like arbitrarily complex software that can be represented by them uh and we've had to build a bunch of stuff to to basically make this possible and uh 6551 is super important here because it basically gives us a way to associate a particular token that is a container with a particular uh orbit node so here you can see like we've got this token ID that represents a, a VM. We give that uh, that ID a TBA, and then the the tokens that that TBA sort of like concretizes are the official software that that uh, uh, node can download. So it's like a it's like a decentralized software license in some ways. Um, and I'm going to show you the the first version of this. Uh, so we are building a Milady derivative project. Uh, and this Milady derivative project is a piece of software running on your orbit. So when you download this token, uh, you you get software, you get one of these containers, and this container serves you this software. So this is what would run on your your own orbit node. It would basically serve you this front end sort of across whatever devices you want. When you connect your wallet, uh, as long as you have some Miladies in in your wallet, uh, what you will see is basically you know your your full collection. Uh, I don't actually own this many, but um, it's useful for for demonstration purposes. And the software lets lets you unbox the attributes of your milady. So this milady has a, a pink coat, a tufted green hair, uh, bar piercings, and barriers. And I'm going to unbox this milady now. Uh, what this is doing is this is basically uh, taking your Urbit, your Urbit has a TBA that owns a, a token that represents the software. The software mints a bunch of uh, sort of derivative tokens based off of your Milady. Uh, the top level token is basically like a doll. And then your doll can now equip the individual items from your Milady. So it's it's a lot like what was sort of occurring in the, the loot project back in 2021. We're, we're basically unbundling the Miladies and letting the user remix all the, the items that they have. Uh, to, to make a new version of the lady. So I'm just going to unbox a bunch here. And then if I come over to uh, our dress up, I've got all these dolls. These dolls have a TVA attached to them. And then you can remix your milady with any of the, the items that you had previously unbundled uh, and, and save them. So this is kind of a common pattern that we're seeing emerge with the 6551 standard is like this idea of inventory. Um, I think what's interesting about this is like it's it's truly sovereign unstoppable software uh, it's running on your node and no one can stop you from doing it um so we're we're pretty excited about this we're we're aiming for sort of like an early september release of this um and we we think that this is like a a, a very good demonstration of not only the the capability of urbit but what we can do with uh 6551 as well Man, that's incredible. This is uh, this is super, super cool to see. Also, like the most full fledged intro to Urbit and demonstration of Urbit software that I've seen. So this is awesome. Very excited to see it. And uh, yeah, let it keep us updated as you keep building this and let us know how we can help. Yeah, we've uh, so we're working with uh, Dan Keller, who I think is on this call. He's actually going to be at, uh, at FWB Fest and I, I think would love to talk to you guys a little bit more about this. Amazing. Yeah, we'd love Hi, to. Hi, I'm them. here. Yes. Uh, hey, Dan. I'll yeah, let's hopefully see you guys uh, over the next few days. And uh, very good demo, Chase. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. Cool. That's it on my end. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Anyone else want to do a demo?
All righty. If not, I guess, Benny, I'll pass it back to you. Cool. Yeah, I think we're probably good to wrap up. Uh, we have uh, five more minutes left. And um, so, yeah, we're really excited about um, the progress. And that was an awesome uh, demo there, uh, Chase. I'm sure a lot of people will uh, want to um, try it out when it's available. Um, yeah, I think from our end, we'll be here mostly this weekend for the fest um, and kind of introducing this idea to the artists and creatives who, who are here. Um, and there's still a lot of work from our end that we haven't touched on maybe for, for the next session. Um, it's probably like an open sea custom zone um, discussion. I think there's still cross chain related questions. Uh, I think some people uh, in the in the working group uh, this week they uh, discovered that um, your mainnet NFT can theoretically own a polygon NFT. I mean, for some most of us here, we're already aware of that. Um, but um, yeah, we, we we definitely have a lot more work on that front. And you know, we have um, team members like Angela, who's also on this call who's been working hard on uh, upgrading the documentations and we'll probably start filming video tutorials and um, content pieces that uh, help kind of, um, you know, inspire folks on, on what sort of things they can be building. And um, yeah, and we'll continue to launch, we ourselves will continue to launch uh, experimental toy projects like the Bead DAO um, that are kind of disguising the the awesome elements of 6551 because um, as you guys all know our background is in, in building like you know consumer experiences that are easy and fun to play with like sapiens and um, the stapleverse project and so we have a few that we want to kind of uh, get out the door uh, mostly for fun um, but of course they'll they'll be using token bound under the hood so thanks again for everyone uh, joining here and as always uh, these are great sessions for us to sync on and any um, demos that the community want to share and so we'll see you all next week uh, on the weekly dev call number 17. Um, thank you for hanging out with us and sharing your thoughts see you guys <laughs>